Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. Uh, do you want to help me take this uh, jumbled pile of Google Docs and make a book out of it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, may have to organize this out a little more. That's exactly what we need to talk about. <laughs> Cue music. And welcome to another episode of Pandas Talking Games. Uh, I'm your host who knows how the intro music goes, Phil. <laughs> and I'm your other host who is going to still maybe blame my lack of knowledge about how the intro music goes on the vaccine. Does that even work anymore? Uh, yeah, you're know. totally... I'm feeling, you're... I'm feeling a lot better now. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, House Pfizer, second dose, right? So you are now a full, Pfizer, fully initiated into House Pfizer? Correct. And and I, I had my little, you know, hazing. Yes, yes. <laughs> for a couple days. Pfizer there. hazing. <laughs> the Pfizer hazing happened, and, uh, and I seem to be back on my feet now. Yes. Yours, uh, Sometime around the middle of the day today, I was like, oh, you know, I think I feel normal again. This is great. I, I'm glad that you didn't get all the... Um, aches and pains and just got the sleepies like i had the sleepies but like anytime i woke up i was like oh like just like it just felt like like some like it, it just felt like my whole body got punched i was hurting in weird ways like i just had different random joints that would start aching and then stop again oh like yeah no not me like, <laughs> by the way now your knee hurts you i know you're not standing or moving or anything but it just hurts now and then it'd be like now it's your shoulder have fun with that it was just like i don't know what's happening that but was I'm not enjoying it that was my whole body <laughs> like i that's I, and that was part of the reason why i slept so much because like i woke up and i'm like i would i would move and i would be like oh what is the point of being awake <laughs> like, what, like yes. there's, this is pointless. I'm going back to sleep. Like, I, I was much more, um, like leaning into the like. I was pretty, frankly, I was doing the my best impression of a narcoleptic. Right? Yeah, I, I was like, yeah. One minute you were having a conversation with me. The next minute I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, the the, the level of fa- like the level of fatigue that kicked in. Um, was pretty, I hadn't really felt that tired since when I broke my arm and I was recovering yeah. from the surgery where yeah. like, I remember one day and I'll tell this and then we'll jump into the topic. I, I remember the first day I took a shower, like, um, without like, like without the bandages, like I was actually able to the, um, dressing I had was waterproof and I like took a shower and like washed my hair. I could only wash my hair one handed, right? Because I couldn't even I couldn't even lift my yeah, arm lift right your at arm, that yeah. point. So I, I like washed my hair one handed. I, and I showered for like the first time in forever, right? And um, I got out of the shower, dried myself off, and then I slept for four hours. Like I was so ex- <laughs> that was it. I was like, that was well, all the energy. I was like, I, I like I combed my hair, and I was like, oh, like the first time in so long, my hair like looks nice again, and, like. And then I like was like I got to I got to the couch downstairs and like for four hours I passed out. I like woke up four hours later and I was like, okay, like that was all like that was all I had in the tank. The sleepies are the like I it, I can handle the sleep. It was for me the um the chills on the first night and the aches. It was weird because I was basically I was exhausted and like slightly dizzy in a like low-grade fever kind of way, but I never actually got the chills or anything. In fact, I was rather hot for a lot of it. I was, like, significantly warmer than I usually am, which was funny for me, because um, I spent, like, the entire summer or uh, winter freezing my butt off. Yeah. And then suddenly it was like, oh, man, it's 68 whole degrees. Break out the summer shirts. I don't need to wear tights. The moral of the story is, folks, that go get your vaccinations and don't yep. worry about the side effects because it's worth they're it. all survivable. <laughs> like yeah, it's, they're it's uncomfortable, 
but they're all survivable. Yeah. I mean, it was so it was it was. It's yeah, fine. it's totally worth it, and the it's relief of just knowing you're vaccinated is totally worth it. So if you haven't gotten oh, vaccinated, boy. we highly encourage you to go get vaccinated. Do your part. Yeah, I have a, I have a timer ticking until I can go hug my other vaccinated friends. Yes, I got twelve days left. There you go. There are hugs on the calendar. <laughs> they're coming. Very good. Okay, we really need to jump into a show and not really and not do. just have an extended bamboo lounge. Um, it's true. <laughs> so um, we need to return to, as promised last week, we need to return to the topic of publishing, which JT yeah. Evans originally asked us to discuss. Right? Yes, indeed. In the Slack room, um, basically, this was a follow up to our design series series, our two part design episodes that was supposed to be one part. You know that part. Um, Because JT was just asking us to basically talk through the publishing process um, as RPGs versus um, his personal experience, which is much more in terms of publishing fiction. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So in our previous episode, um, our previous episode, we looked at um, a method, the steps involved, a method for uh, publishing a book. And again, that was all um, highly... um, highly influenced by the only experience I have in publishing books, which is encoded. Technically I've also yes. done it for engine as well. Um, but I'm much more hands-on in the encoded side than I was for engine. Um, and we talked a little bit about EPUBs and things like that. Okay. Uh, but today I, I pulled out my soapbox and everything. Yeah, you did. We can't talk about <laughs> publishing without you getting your soapbox out about EPUBs. Um, I know. <laughs> okay. So, we'll, so what I want to talk about, um, I want to, I want us to talk about, is I want to talk about the the difference between designing a game and publishing a game because a lot of people uh, merge these two things together and they're kind of discrete entities. And I want to talk about the differences between them um, in terms of predictability, planning, and things like that because um, it has a lot to do with uh, Kickstarters, Kickstarter fulfillment, um, if you're really getting serious about planning, um, like release dates and, and release cycles of, of products and things like that, right? Like there's, there's some things that, um, knowing the difference between these two things is important. And honestly, I'll tell you that if, if the, if your one main takeaway from tonight, um, from this is that you understand the difference about when a designer says their game is being designed versus them publishing it. Uh, it will inform you greatly to how you should expect a Kickstarter to go. Yeah, How so you should expect it. Even to go, if you're yes. never going to publish your own stuff, this is good knowledge for understanding how to read Kickstarters and kind of understand what to expect. Um, when you get into, um, when you start backing Kickstarters, as if you were going to start today, you're all, most of you are already backing them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or backing many of them, right? Oh, man. Jian Shim's new game kickstarts tomorrow, and I'm going to be backing it. It'll be last week when y'all hear this, but... But it'll already be backed by that point. I'm so already excited. And hopefully, anyway. fingers crossed, already published. I'm sorry, not published. Already <laughs> no, funded. already designed. Um, already, oh yeah, hopefully already funded by the time you listen yes. to this. Anyway, okay. check it out. It's going to be real cool. All right. So when we did the design, um, episodes, the design series, right? One of the things we talked about with design was kind of, it's unpredictable and it's hard to schedule that it's an iterative process and you kind of just have to go through it. And like, you know, when your game is done, when it's done kind of thing, or when you ultimately get fed up with it, you don't want to look at it anymore. Then it's done. Um, that is a good way to tell that it's done also. <laughs> right. Um, and the thing about that is that because design is so iterative, right? We talked about like you design, you play test, you get feedback, you redesign. And you keep going around that because you don't know what you're going to uncover, because you don't know what feedback you're going to get, because you don't know when you pull on one part of the game structure, what happens to the other parts of the game structure and have to compensate for it, right? Design can take a while. And I think what we've said, and I don't think this is very far off for most designers. I think this will be plus minus some months, but most designers will tell you that designing a game is about a two year cycle. I think two years sure, to publish, think, two years yeah, to. I, I, it, I think it varies drastically depending on how big of a game we're talking about, since I tend to consume and then also 
be inspired to create a bunch of very short games, I, I think that cycle gets shorter. Okay, right? I think that's I, I think that's very fair. I think like yeah. m- perhaps quote a full size RPG. A quote a quote full like yeah. if you're gonna design. Uh, a full, you know, powered by the apocalypse or something like that. Sure, about, about yeah. two but years. It, if you're if you're making a hack of lasers and feelings, yeah, you might not be talking probably about gonna go pretty quick. Sick. Sure, yeah. all right, that's fair. That's fair. I, like you know what, strike that statement, um, <laughs> but just take away from it that obviously the more game you have. Um, the more iterations you're probably doing because the more extensive your playtesting is going to need to be, the more things you're going to find when you playtest, the more things you're going to have to fix, and the more interactions you're going to have to account for. Okay. Yes. That's complicated. It is complicated. (laughs) And it's hard to schedule. In fact, it's hard enough to, and as a professional project manager, and I can say this with some, um, I can say that as an actual professional project manager, it's hard to schedule those kinds of things it actually falls into more of what software development is like and as we know from um video game industry if you've ever done um if you've ever worked for a company that delivers apps like you will know that (laughs) deadlines for software are very hard to meet yeah like yeah it's very hard to meet the deadlines um, for software projects unless a project manager is really good and has buffered it out really far to kind of, you know, um, hedge their bets. But, you know, it's not uncommon to hear about video games getting pushed back. It's not uncommon to hear about apps getting delayed, that kind of thing. Like, it's pretty common because it's hard. It That iterative, de- that develop, test, fix kind of cycle takes a while. What's the point? Let's contrast that to publishing. Publishing is actually a pretty knowable uh, process, and it doesn't really have a lot of iteration. And um, most professionals can tell you how long their parts will take. Like an editor can tell you roughly how many pages they can edit in a day, an hour, whatever. Um, A writer usually knows... uh, their writing speed. Now, I will note that right, there are two writing speeds for all writers. Uh, there is the speed at which you write uh, fiction and prose, and then there is a much slower speed <laughs> at which you write rules. Um, rules are um, a very slow... Like You do not write rules at the same speed that you write um, setting material, prose, and things like that. But writers know... Most writers know their speeds... Most editors know how, like, how long it'll take them to edit, you know, based on how many words or whatever. Uh, proofreaders, same thing. Layout people usually know how many pages they can lay out um, in a, you know, in a week or a day or whatever. Um, and what this means, and, and oh, and I should say, and on the separate, on the sec- separate track, the graphics. Most artists know how much time they need to put um, from sketch to final. Now, this will vary based on your expertise. This will vary based on your experience. But by and large, um, these are knowable quantities. Mm -hmm. So as a project manager and having been the project manager on on, um, both of Encoded's um, book publications, uh, we were able to um, map that out with reasonable accuracy by basically saying like, okay, um, if our manuscript is 64,000 words going to like Sean Merwin, our editor, how long will it take you to edit 64,000 words and getting, you know, and getting the estimate from him. And Bob, if that, you know, if that 64,000 words translates to this many pages, uh, how long do you think that'll take to proof? And Tim, um, you know, if we're looking at this many words, approximately this many pages in a six by nine format, you know, what do you think? Uh, And, you know, and with that, as a project manager, you can actually lay that out, right? By because it's a it's a it's a knowable process, um, and it can be it can be relatively um, it can be relatively accurately estimated. I mean, I should slip in here and say if you've ever backed an encoded Kickstarter, then you've actually seen this in action, right? In all the fill emails yes. that come out, because there's a little graphic in them. That shows the progress and like the estimates and like basically the reporting on the timeframes and where everything is at all times, right? 
I, that is a thing. Not, I mean, not all developers do it. I no, um, but you're a professional project manager, so I'm just saying. Yeah. If you've ever backed an encoded <laughs> Kickstarter, you've seen this actual, like, visually in action. Yes, you will get the you will get the um, thematic. You will get the thematic um, <laughs> Gantt chart yes. that uh, that that will show you the progress of the project, and it'll actually show you our estimates against our actuals. Um, yeah. Because there are overruns, right? Like these things do happen. Um, if like like look, if all you had to do was stick the estimates together and make a timeline, um, everybody could learn that skill. The the pro- some of the project management part is like how then do you catch back up, or how like where can I like where can I borrow a little to stretch a little, those kinds of things. And you see that if you've followed one of our Kickstarters, like you will hear like when like. Oh, layout took us longer than expected, right? So you see the you know actual bar grow past the the estimate bar, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I just had to point that out because it's one of the really interesting things that I think that um, lots of people on their Kickstarters um, talk about where things are, and I appreciate that y- you're very like, and this is exactly what's happening. Well, and and the thing is about it because. Um, because this part of the process, the publishing process, is really knowable, and because we don't publish like ridiculously large books, like in the hundreds of thousands of words, the actual timeline for the publishing of the book isn't terribly long, like post Kickstarter. Yeah. So, like, I'm cool telling you weekly how we're doing. Yeah. Right. Like, and, and I know like some, you know, like there's, um, I think, you know, every, everybody who runs a Kickstarter has a different feel about it, but, um, I have to report weekly on the status of all my projects at my day job. I'm used to reporting weekly on the progress of our, um, of, you know, of our Kickstarter projects. And I like it. Like, here's the, here's my philosophy. I don't think, I mean, let's not get hyperbolic here. I don't think you can over communicate on a Kickstarter. Um, when people back a Kickstarter, it is a parasocial relationship, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I, if I just wanted to buy the game, I could just wait till it comes out on the shelf. Yeah. I'm backing it to support the people who make it. And in some way, kind of like being part of the team. Yeah. So, so part of what I do as the project manager for, and you know, this will tie in, we'll get back to, some more about publishing thing, but part of what I do as the project manager for the Kickstarter is I'm going to make you feel like part of the team. Like we're going to, I'm going to talk to you about like how things are going. Like, did we run into any problems? Like those kinds of things. And I appreciate other designers who also do that. I I'm yeah. backing a fantastic um, zine quest. I forget the exact name of the um, of the zine, but it's the one where the person's remaking the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I think they communicate right. every two weeks. Yeah, but it's, it's so real. Good. But they do like a really good job of communicating, um, yeah. and I definitely feel like I understand like where everything is. Yeah. Okay. So I digress, which could lead to a Sorry. whole separate Kickstarter yeah. discussion I, later. I, I, I ripped you off track there a little no, it's bit, okay. but I had to say it. <laughs> no, it's okay, because this is really the important takeaway here, is that um, publishing is a thing I can schedule. Design is a thing I can guess at. Yeah. So, if you never publish a book and you're just backing Kickstarters, keep this in mind. One, Kickstarter always requires you to stick a date on Mm -hmm. on a on like the deliverables for a tier right so it's not that it's not that um it's not that people are lying to you when it says like coming november you know of 2021 and you don't get it till january 2023 it's that literally they had to put a date on it and wherever that person was at that time that was their you know optimistic guess at where they would land yeah so if the kickstarter is to fund the design and publication. The chance the date is going to hit is much lower than if the Kickstarter is only for the publication. Yes. Now, that is not to say you shouldn't back Kickstarters that are design and publish because a lot of times designers, especially if they're full-time designers, also need that money to live. 
Yes. So you should yep. support that effort. Um, but just understand that if they're designing the game, like literally they're writing the game while they're doing the Kickstarter and then planning to publish it and they think they're going to be done on certain on a such and such date, the confidence interval that they're actually going to be on that date is pretty low. Uh, it'll probably be longer. Um, just take that into account. And don't, you know, like knowing that. Don't cho- yell at people. Yeah, knowing that, choose to back, understand that it's going to take longer. Be, be nice to people on Kickstarter. I mean, in general, you should be nice to people for Kickstarter, <laughs> unless like it's a total ripoff. And I've had like two of those since I've ever backed Kickstarter. The vast majority of Kickstarters I've had have been excellent people trying really hard. Um, and it's hard to guess some of these durations. Like, I get it wrong. And I mean, I get it wrong and I'm an actual project manager. Like I've made, I mean, you can see in both of the encoded projects that the schedule's off by now, granted, I'm pretty proud. Like I think the most we've ever been off is six weeks. Um, yeah. In Kickstarter Which, time, I yeah, think that's... In the scale of Kickstarter is nothing. Right. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's not too shabby. Um, yeah. But... Um, but estimates are hard. Estimates are hard for actual pro- like estimates are hard in, in project management in general. They're even harder if you've never like if you haven't done a bunch of them. If you don't know how to kind of coax people and round up and all that stuff. Um, but again, going back to the publishing part, this publishing thing is pretty knowable, um, and every publisher will have their own. Uh, pipeline, and I don't think they're radically different than the one I described. Like, I don't think anyone lays out the book and edits it at the end. Somebody, now that I've said it, somebody does that. But that's really dumb. You shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> you should definitely edit you before. Edit it first. <laughs> I'm I, I'm I'm saying it because somebody out there is going to be like, nope, such and such game designer like lays out their game before it gets edited, and that's well, you know what? Then that you can do that. Like, I can't do that. I don't have the, either the technology or whatever, the patience or whatever. I, I like my, I like, I like, I like my order. Um, I'm cool with that. Okay. So the other thing to take into account is um, when we talk about planning out the publication, that um, timeline, those estimates get more complicated as more people are added to the project. Yes. So if you have a single author writing a game, uh, then you only have to account for one person turning in their stuff on time to to uh, to get it going. If you have 12 authors <laughs> contributing material to your game, the chance that somebody's not going to be on time goes up. And because of that, you can only get so far through that um, through that chain before everything jams up. So, for instance, when we did, um, I say we. I'll, I'll be more clear. When Encoded Design, I'm sorry, Engine Publishing, the other yep, one, sure, you'll the other there. one that starts with an E. When, <laughs> when Engine Publishing, <laughs> when Engine Publishing did uh, the. Um, Eureka and Masks books, we did that with 10 authors. Yeah. And that's a lot of wrangling when you have 10 part-time authors who have other gigs or day jobs or kids. And, and I say, or all of the above, right. right? <laughs> Those can all just be ands like strung <laughs> together. Um, Hello. <laughs> right. So when you have 10 contributors, like now the chance that all the writing is going to come in on time, is pretty much zero. Yeah. But you can then take like the writing that does come in, you can send that through editing. Right? And maybe even through proofing. And maybe you can even get it to lay out if everything's really discreet. Like, you know, um, Phil is writing these chapters and John is going to write these chapters. Like, I can even get it to lay out. But at some point in that publication chain, you will hit a wall... Bef- you know, if you don't have all the pieces. Yep. Um, also, the thing that then increases, right, if you have more writers, um, is the chance that somebody can't finish the yes. work. Like, that's a, that's a, um, that becomes like a more of a disaster, like, that's a disaster control kind of thing, like, where you have to, like, either finish it yourself. Um, I'm not going to name names, but I know a, um, there is a 
uh, publisher I have worked with many times in the past, and I've done project management for them, um, where this problem has arisen, where um, somebody can't complete um, the assignment, and so like another writer has to come in, or the publisher comes in and finishes out that section. Um, that adds time on mm-hmm. you know onto the project and like holds up where you know like ultimately where things can go. Um, the same thing if you're using multiple artists. Um, you run into this, uh, you run into the same level of complexity. Uh, also, um, if you're coordinating all this, um, the more people you have, the more check-ins, touch bases, things like that you have to do. One of the, I'm, I'm going to just say this. One of the reasons that both encoded books ran really smoothly is we had one author yeah, and one artist. Yeah. And that does, so on on the one hand it's a very controllable and schedule kind of schedulable that's a project management term i guess <laughs> um it's very easy to schedule that kind of stuff on the other hand it sucks for diversity yeah right like it sucks for diversity and inclusive I- inclusivity because one author one artist doesn't really leave you a lot of um it doesn't leave it doesn't leave you a lot of options um right. You know, you can't go having out and add a bunch more people. Yeah, having four or five artists, for instance, on a project really opens up the chance to work with a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Um, but understand, and again, like you know, have sympathy for the people who are running these kind of complex projects. When you do that, um, that's a lot more management and a lot more things you have to juggle in that publishing pipeline. Because mm-hmm. now I need five artists to come in with their pieces on time to get through layout. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, that's, that's just more challenging. Um, so if you're new to publishing, consider starting small, few number of people, the fewer number of people involved, the uh, more streamlined your process is going to be. Um, if you're going to be bold and aggressive, then give yourself big patches of like, give yourself big chunks of time. Right. Extra so, time. Spare time. So, so if you want to just jump in and just be like, nope, I'm gonna do ten, I'm gonna do ten authors and ten artists, cool. Just make really big blocks of time for how much time it takes for the writing to come in, how much time it takes for the art to come in. Um, because it's just gonna I can tell you, even with the most professional writers and the most professional artists, life just happens. Yeah. And 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 you have to be able to accommodate some of that. Because I think there are just, because of the, the actual way that this industry works, like there are just so many of us who are not full-time, right? I mean, even if you are full-time, I've seen catastrophic <laughs> things like uh, computers just die and oh, the person gosh. doesn't have a backup computer. No. Right? Like, I mean, just so, <laughs> oh, like, no. I, I mean, I've heard horror stories of... Um, and again, I'm not going to name any names, but I heard a horror story once of a publisher who had a book and the layout person's computer died and they didn't have any backups. Oh, God. And the entire layout of the book was lost and had Gone. to be restarted. Right? Like, <sighs> these are, like, the the number of unavoidable, like, the number of things that could happen. Somebody gets sick. Um, like, the project takes longer than expected and your one writer runs up against their finals schedule, mm-hmm. right? Like there's so many of these things. So the, the takeaway here is that um, when you see those really big Kickstarters, 20 person teams, right? A, a whole list of writers and a whole list of artists understand that is a much harder thing to manage than, um, than if you have a smaller group. Now, the way to mitigate that is to um, have more of it in hand before you launch the Kickstarter. Yeah. But that requires you to have yeah. money. Yeah. You have to have the monies to pay for some of that up yeah. front. Yeah. So not being reliant on the Kickstarter to fund it. So yeah, that's, that's, that can be prohibitive. That's, that's prohibitive, right? There are certain, there are certain companies, like there are certain companies and certain people who can afford, to do that, right? So let, let's just talk about that. If I wanted to really land the publication part of a, of, a, of a book that had a lot of authors and a lot of artists, if I could afford to pay them up front and get all their parts in before I launch the Kickstarter, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Then while the Kickstarter's going, I have all the pieces. I can go into the pipeline and start push and start producing the book. Yeah. And I look, then I look really fast, right? Yeah. But yeah. that's usually not how it goes. Like no, because you usually are, you usually need the Kickstarter funding to pay the people, right? And you can usually, that's usually get people what you're doing it for, <laughs> right? And you can usually get people on board to start mm-hmm. working if the Kickstarter gets funded. Yes. Right, because they know if it gets funded, they're getting paid. Yes. Um, so also tricky, right? Like the like those are so it's hard again, hard to manage really large, like really big project teams on these things, unless you have a lot of money, um, or you just you know set a more realistic end date. Yeah. Um, because it's going to take longer, or yeah. even factor in like, hey, we're going to get in, like we're going to do, um. Like we're having, uh, you know, our core team, our core writer, our core team of writers are writing the rules and we have like eight other people that are writing, um, setting packs for our game, whatever setting packs means. But conceivably, if we lost two of them, like we could still publish this. Yeah. Like we could release those later as supplemental PDFs and we could just put six in the book and keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we structured the book where the setting packs are the last chapter of the book anyway. So, so we really can even we can even lay out stuff all the way up to that chapter. Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, I tell you what, let's move on a little bit and talk sure. about um publishing formats. Okay. So <laughs> again, another another <laughs> axes of complexity. <laughs> yes. Right. So uh, right. So the easiest thing to publish is going to be the digital download version of something. Well, 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 well. Mm, mm, I'm mm. saying digital download because I don't want to say the three letters. No, I would specifically say PDF because there's other complexity if you involve other digital download formats. Okay, let's then, then let's go ahead with PDF. I was <laughs> yes, trying to so avoid okay. it, but let's say PDF. I think you have to okay. say PDF. PDF is probably the easiest thing to produce because anything that lays out text produces a PDF now. Yeah. And probably wasn't always true, like in the grand history of, of publication. But if you get Affinity, if you get, um, like if you get Affinity, um, oh, what the hell is it? Um, not designer. Designer's the, one, the drawing one. Publisher. Affinity publisher, InDesign, whatever. They're going to output right Pages, to PDF. Word. <laughs> like, whatever. You give me that look, but it's true. You could still output to PDF if you wanted to. You can. Okay. So PDF is by far the easiest. Um, mm-hmm. the, the application will do almost all the work for you. Um, and ideally if the only thing you were putting out as PDF is you would put out the PDF and maybe you have to do this manually, or maybe if you've set it up correctly in the program, you won't have to, but I'm a stickler for two levels of PDF bookmarks as well as the other one, which I'm a huge stickler for is, um, you need to set the page one of the, mm-hmm. yes. the the one that yeah. says number the page that you says really number do. one needs, needs to, to be needs to say one yeah in the PDF you gotta, you gotta fix and those you, yeah as someone who 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 was professionally I, paid to fix this like you just gotta take all that stuff at the beginning you give it Roman numerals whatever you need to do the first page that says page one in the book needs to be page one and 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 Adobe will fix that automatically. Like if you just say like page five of my PDF is page one, it will just go back and renumber the other ones in Roman numeral. Cool. Like you, like you don't have Mm -hmm. to figure that out. Like you just have, but do it, but people don't realize. Okay. So, all right. In case you've never realized this, (laughs) when you output, when you make the book, when you make the book inside, like, um, it, like inside, uh, in design or whatever, you've got the cover, Right. Mm-hmm. Then you got like the table of contents. Mm-hmm. Um, you got, you've got the you, first, you've you got the credit a page, ti- a title that, page. Yeah. You got the title page. Right. You got your copyright page. Right. You get all sorts of stuff before there's actually a page number appearing on a page. Sure. You, and you all know this because you've all picked up a book. But yes, when you do it to PDF, if you don't tell the PDF program anything, it assumes the cover of the book is page one. Yep. Now, <laughs> If you're if you've in your layout also put page numbers in the body of your book, which you did because you would not be cruel to not put page numbers in your <laughs> oh in your dear. in your in your layout. Yes. 
Now, the PDF page one, which is the cover, is not the same as page one of the book, Mm -hmm. which is now six pages in. Yep. And where that becomes a problem is if you've ever played at a game table where uh-huh. half the people own the the book and half the people own the PDF and somebody's like, hey, what page is that rule on? And you say 250 and you go, go to page 250 and you are on like page 246. Mm-hmm. Like it's a pain in the ass. It's huge pain. And it is. It's, it's very the annoying. Smallest. And... and- all of your page references inside the book will match the page numbers. But when it says, you know, ooh, if you're more interested in reading more about this on page 32, and I go and tap on page 32, but it's actually page 28, that's really annoying. Or the index is wrong, <laughs> oh, or the table the of contents is, is wrong. Up. Right. And, yeah, I, no. and, and I know we're making a big deal out of this. But it's really but annoying, you, and it's easy to fix. You would be surprised how many times this comes up comes up a lot yeah and it comes up a lot sometimes from publishers that i don't even like i would expect to just catch that but there's a little bit of massaging you have to do to get your pdf finished okay but if you now want to make it into a hard copy book that is like one step more complex because now you need to involve a printer Right. I'm, I'm. I have a face because I have to add my other thing in here. Right. Yes. Because if you want to also turn it now into an EPUB, yes. that is another step of complexity. Also, but it is a step of complexity that shears away from the complexity of like actual printing because it is a different format with different expectations and different basic properties. And I won't go on too much of a rant about it right but it is a whole other like it's a whole other beast. it is a whole other beast yeah okay so if you're gonna and i'll speak to book for a second so if you're gonna do a book and my experience with this thus far has been um with lightning source which is the uh print house that um is used by drive through yeah it's also um it's owned by a company called ingram which is the largest distributor of books and printer of books in the united states um so they do a lot of print on demand and they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah. So the way that you have to prepare your PDFs for printing is not the same as how you have to prepare your PDF for digital download. Correct. So you you often I shouldn't say often. I've I've it's been my experience. You have to provide the separate cover. The mm-hmm. cover gets printed yes, like in one part of the facility. The book gets printed in the other. And then at some point, the two are are joined together. Yeah, you've seen this? I've literally been in this warehouse. So like, let me let me pause you for a second. Yeah, yeah. So the machines that print the covers are in fact different machines. And um, they they actually just print out just just the cover. But it is it is front spine back, right? As a single sheet. And yep. that's the cover printed. The machines that print the pages of the book take these spools of paper that look like receipt tape, except that they're like two feet wide and weigh as much as like six or seven of me, right? Like these things are taller than me. They are huge. And these giant reams of paper are loaded into these huge printers that are like the size of my office. And it runs through and it prints both of the facing pages. And then it flips over and prints the other side. And then it runs it through a thing that folds it into in half into the pages. And then it runs it into the thing that slices it along the pages. And then they come out in stacks. So when you walk through this warehouse, you walk past all of these carts that are just holding stacks, labeled stacks of paper, right? Because all you really have is the pages. And then they go to a separate part where they actually take the covers and like there's a machine that like depending on what kind of cover you want because hard cover is different than soft cover, etc. Like soft covers are automated. Hard covers still involve a lot of manual like they put the thing in, they put the glue on, they hold the thing down, it glues it on kind of situation. But like it's actually really cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's actually really cool and exciting. And it's something that like. Uh, I wish I still worked in publishing because this kind of stuff obviously excites me. But if that um, gives you kind of an idea of what we're really talking about when we talk about print on demand, they really do just have massive printers. You order something, it goes to a machine, it gets queued up, it gets printed. Yeah. Like at my house, except the machine folds it, glues it, 
does the and then somebody puts a cover on right like blink right <laughs> now we should differentiate right print on demand is a type of printing that uses um slightly uh less quality paper that allows for very small print runs like literally you could print a book yeah you can print a single book which is or and i'm sorry because i jumped you could, right into the print on demand without no it's okay that. But you could, right, you could print a book or you can print a thousand books. Right. Offset can, printing, which, again, the process isn't radically different than what you described. Offset printing um, requires much bigger runs. Like you have to do like hundreds, thousand or more of, of a book. Um, usually but you can usually tend, a minimum of 2,000 for right. offset. But you, you can tend to get much higher quality um, materials. So the thing that I will say about that as someone, again... <laughs> Here we go. go. I have a, I have opinions. Um, the quality of print on demand, especially in like the last like five to ten years, has increased drastically. The biggest thing that you miss, miss in print on demand versus um, a more traditional print run is you can't get some of the fancy things like you can't get a stitched binding. Yeah, it's going to be glued. You can't get. Um, some of the fancy hardcover treatments, right? Bookmarks because, put in, yeah, like glossy, you, glossy. Um, you can that use gloss. Spot gloss. You can, can you do spot, spot gloss? gloss? Yeah. Okay. Um, but but so like there are limitations because you have to remember that because they could be printing just one, the cover is always going to be a glued cover. But yep. in terms of like the paper quality and stuff that you can get now, pretty similar, very similar, and it's much more about how much you want to spend on it. Because it is more expensive to print a single book than to print 2,000 books. I mean, when you talk about on a book-by-book book basis, yep. in theory. Now, we could get into a whole bunch of publishing industry stuff on the additional costs of warehousing and storing and all sorts of other things, which is why it becomes actually very cost-effective if you're not, if you have no expectation of selling 2,000 books it is probably more cost effective to pay more for an individual book on a book by book basis than to have to store the other thousand books that you didn't sell for however many years you're going to sit on them um, and potentially pay to have them destroyed at the point where you decide not to store them anymore. Um, so also, know. also, <laughs> so you've talked about, so you talked about warehousing, um, yeah. ev even if you warehouse it yourself and you're like, well, I'm just going to keep them then in my it's house. Your basement. Well, that's fine. But here's the <laughs> other thing. Um, for tax purposes, mm -hmm. your inventory of books is yeah. counts on your taxes as yes. potential money. So um, one of the other things that you have to factor in is that if you are sitting with a thousand books, um, there is a tax liability for yes. having a thousand, <laughs> a thousand pieces of inventory that you have not moved. Yes. Um, whereas with print on demand, uh, you hold nothing, you have nothing you have to declare nothing. Yep. Like, and then somebody buys the book and you make the magic money. Right. Now the difference is, <laughs> and, and, and this is the point you touched on. The difference is POD, the um, cost to the cost of the book for the publisher on is the higher. Book basis. Yes. Right. Is higher than the cost of the book in a offset print run, which means that in an offset print run, you get more profit on your $30, 50 $70 book than you did on POD. But mm -hmm. if you are super small, um, one, you don't have to front as much money. Two, you don't have to handle warehousing. And again, wherever you warehouse it, your home, an actual warehouse or whatever, there is another term called fulfillment, mm -hmm. which is you need to go put a book in the mail to give, like to sell to someone. And if you do that, you're, taking it out of your own time, but you also have to have shipping materials, labels, tape, uh, mailers, things like that. Or you pay somebody to do that. So that also eats a little at your uh, margins. My recommendation is that under a certain size of a publishing company, POD is great because while you get less money from the each unit, the like in the case of drive through and lightning source, Lightning Source prints that book and ships that book. Oh yeah, I can tell you about the you. shipping the shipping warehouses too because they are massive because they do so right. much fulfillment for Amazon books. And they get decent <laughs> and they get decent prices. They get decent yes. prices on their shipping because they're shipping at they volumes so that much of it. right that you can never achieve. So 
even if they're paying, even if they're eating into your margin, it's not terrible. Um, so there's one other thing that I will um, throw in um, that I just forgot. Darn it. I'm Never sorry. mind. That's okay. I completely lost it. It was really interesting, but keep going and maybe okay, it'll come back fine. to me. That's fine. <laughs> um, and again, that's not to say that offset printing isn't a good idea. Offset Ooh, printing is great. I yes, remembered it. <laughs> sorry. There's one other thing that we should say, and this is really interesting because it's not something I think we run into with RPGs specifically a ton, but I want to throw it out there, right? Because you could do it like this. Um, which is that if you go through someone like Drive Through RPG, each book is its individual print run. You're always paying for the scale of a single book, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's always a single person ordering it from Drive Through, and then Lightning Source prints it, and then they ship it to that person. It's a single book. Um, if you're like, I did this Kickstarter and I need 300 books, you can get 300 books printed at some place like Lightning Source, and the scale will make a difference in terms of your cost, right? Because they do scale that cost. So the more books that you're getting as a single order, the more that order scales. Now, then you still have fulfillment issues, etc. Because if you ship 300 books to your house now, you still have to get them out. Yes. But like there is there is another piece to that. Oh, which yeah. I don't think that as an industry we necessarily engage with a ton because it's a lot easier for us as small companies to just be like, cool, you take care of it, Ingram, and that's great. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I mean. And as a personal preference yes. for encoded, I um, they can do it. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Yes, I don't make. Yes, like encoded doesn't make as much money per unit, but also I have no inventory on my taxes. Yep. I have no warehousing needs. Yep. Um, I don't have to worry like about if the book falls out of popularity and now I'm stuck with, you know, five hundred copies, copies of it. Yeah. Like it's it, it prints when it's popular. Right. Yep. And, and that's, and, and also I never have to worry about it again. Yes. Like, like <laughs> I, once I put it up on drive through, I like, I can move on to the next project and I never have to be like, well, I got to do another print run cause I'm running out of books. Like yep. now at a certain level that changes yeah. right? at a certain level I'm as a publisher you are, and as a business, you are better off doing the um, offset print run and, yes. and handling those other things. But if you are, a super tiny, like encoded. Super itty bitty. <laughs> yeah, if you are a super tiny publishing company, POD is a um, POD is a lifesaver um, and a game changer. It, it really makes print publication possible in yes. a lot of ways that it did not used to be possible. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I am still obviously pretty excited and hyped about it, even though I don't even work I, 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 I'm, I'm fine with it. it unless you're into the collecting part of um unless you're into the collecting part of role-playing games or um you're really into um digging the art the artistic aesthetic of role-playing games um like if you're just like i, I just want the book because i, I want to play the game like POD is going to be perfectly fine. Like well, you're I mean, never, you're never going to notice. You can shell out on a POD to get really nice paper to have oh, really yeah. good color. They have different machines that print black and white versus color, etc. You can shell out to have a hard cover. You can, you know, you can do those things. So you can still accomplish well, a and lot. I'll, and, honestly, and I'll say this: like for drive through, some of the options are a little more limited than just straight through Lightning Source they have, because. Yeah, I think drive through has simplified it down a little bit to be like, these are the things that... Yeah, so you don't get with. quite all the options. But like, for instance, even when I do black and white books, I print them in the premium color. Correct. Yes, always do that. <laughs> right, because then I get the grayscale. Like, yes. I get the premium grayscale. Okay, I want to touch on one last thing. So printing yes. a book is a thing. Um, the It adds another level of complexity into your scheduling because one of the things you have to do with book printing is you have to print a proof of the book. Yes. So you actually have to, um, so we talked about like you have to proofread your PDF, but yes. you also have to get a proof of your book and physically go through it. Yeah. You need um, to make sure that it actually prints the way that you expected it to print yes. before you print it and send it to everyone. Correct. And, and we, uh, we at encoded are only 50%. Um, we have a 50% chance of getting it right. <laughs> um, through, through like when we get the proof, normally what happens is when you see the proof, um, you start, um, not that you find like mistakes, like grammar stuff, but you find the things that are a little harder, which is like the printing stuff. Like I remember with our first book, 
um, we got it and the text went too far into the gutter. Yeah. So we like had to kind of like, like, so we had to do like, we had to push that out and reformat the book. Um, and then like reformat the files, send it and get another proof to just, you know, to get the gutter, um, cleared. And again, the gutter is that part of the middle of the book where the, where the spine is, where you open it. You don't want the text falling into the curved part. Yeah. You got to be able to read it. It has to be on the part of the book that opens. Yeah. Um, and sometimes colors might be off. Like you go to print it and you're like, Ooh, that color didn't look right. Or that looked fine on the screen, but Ooh, looks terrible through the printer. Um, or I've had like less of those problems. Layering stuff in PDFs where sometimes you're like, Oh yes. no, that ended up in the wrong layer and did not print yeah. the way I expected it to. Yeah. So that, so there's, so there is a round of, um, and, and you'll hear, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll hear, uh, publishers talk about this, that they got the, the book, they got the, uh, the book proof and they're going through it. Mm-hmm. Like when we do it for, um, when we do it at encoded, the most important person to go through the book proof is the art director. Yeah. At that point, like yeah. we've all yeah. had our say about it up to the part where it became a book. But at that point, like we all look through it and we're like, yeah, yeah, it kind of looks okay. And then Tim looks at it and gets real picky about it. Yeah. And then we have a conversation about, is this a thing we really need to fix? Or is this a thing where next time you want to do whatever? But like perhaps a um, illustration got too close to the line where it gets cut and you don't like the way it looks, whatever. Right. Because you got to deal with things like bleed. Yeah. Where it ends up getting trimmed, blah, 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 right? Because yep. all that's and happening you, by machine. It doesn't know where the edges are. It's just like, okay, well, it no, should be it knows inch, where. Bam. No, no, it knows where the edges yeah. are. I mean. You just, did you, did, did you, you adhere did to you it? Did you adhere to that? <laughs> yes. That's, that's what we should say. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes the proof just comes back wrong. Like I had a proof, um, we had a proof for, I think for um, Avalon where I got the book and the book was a mess and I checked the file that I submitted and I was like, there isn't anything wrong with this. And I contacted our drive through rep. They talked to lightning source and they were like, no, you're right. The file's fine. Mm, like I sent them something. pictures of the book. They yeah. looked and they were like, no, that's just a printing error. We'll yeah. print you another proof and send it to you right away. Yeah. And like, it was fine and we didn't have to do anything. But like when I first got the book, I'm like, you're like, Oh God, what happened? Oh, it was like a, it was a total mess. Like it was just like something was off and it was like um pages were missing oh boy. and like it was oh it was the kind of thing you never want to see in a proof no. right like because i'm like no Heart no attack. way <laughs> like no way did we do this and send this to the printer right yeah. but like you don't know so all right the last step again we're talking about scale like levels of complexity here right the last step would be in terms of an rpg if you want to publish a box set yeah. Right. Or anything with things. Bits and pieces. Because now, much like when we talked about having nine different writers, if I'm going to produce a game that has tokens and an embroidered bag and a map and a this and a that and a this, whatever, and I want to send that all out and I ideally want to only send it once because I want to have one shipping cost, not eight shipping costs, um, each one of those components typically has to come from somewhere else. The book printer is going to print your book, probably your handouts, maybe your GM screen, like your printable things. Yep. But they're probably not the person who does your plastic tokens. Yeah, probably or not. <laughs> like, you know, or your minis or what or your embroidered like Bags. they're probably not those people. There's another group of people who do those things. But now you have to get all those parts to come together in one place, it could be your house. Mm-hmm. You could be doing this at your table, or it could be your fulfillment partner, right? Mm-hmm. So in case like uh, IPR, um, backer kit, things like that, you have all those parts sent to them, but they can't ship until they have all the parts to put in the box. Yep. So sometimes that will also add to the tail end of the of the project because like let's say uh let's say you, you the book arrives at the warehouse and the GM screens arrive those all look good um and your embroidered things come in fine and your plastic tokens were on a container ship that was going through the Suez Canal. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. 
right? Um, <laughs> and you have no idea when you will ever see them again. Right. Like <laughs> they're like, just gone, my friends. Yeah, like you you know, gone. you order you ordered these, you know, you they're ordered these overseas and they were put on a container ship and Oh no. You know, uh, I mean these oh, things no. happen, right? The Suez oh, Canal no. one's very topical, but like oh, no, no, um, no, 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 union no. strikes at union strikes at uh, ports and like so all of a sudden now your tokens haven't arrived and now you're into um do i do i ship without the tokens and pay extra to ship the tokens when they arrive do i hold everything in place like again the complexity part right the Uh more parts you got coming in the The more more. things could potentially go wrong before they all arrive right i feel like tonight's is less about publishing more about project management i think kind of is um it's okay. But, but we, we but, talk about PDFs versus or POD versus offset, but I we did. that's not but super I, specific to RPGs. No, but I guess what we're trying to get at here is that while the core of publishing, and maybe this is the cue for us to wrap up the show, mm, while the core of publishing is a pretty well known and understood um like process, and each person's process will be a little different. There's a lot of places where you can make it more or less complex. Yes. Right. You can have more authors, less authors. You can have more artists, less artists. You can uh, only produce a PDF or you could produce a book and a PDF or you could produce um, the book, the PDF plus a box set. And the EPUB. And an EPUB. I'm just going to keep saying it. (laughs) No, no, it's fine. It's good. I'm glad you're saying it. I am manifesting the RPG I, books look, that I want to see. I'm raising my hand here. I'm raising my hand here right now, making a vow that Turning Point will be an EPUB. Of course it will. Yeah. I am going to make it. <laughs> Turning Point is a perfect candidate for EPUB. Anyway, uh, I think I even said that last week. But anyway, the point is that that simple spine of of publishing can get really complicated by by how big of a project you make it, and sometimes new publishers bite off more than they can chew, mm-hmm. right? Like they, they're going to go, they, they swing for the fences, you know, and they just, they make a project so complicated that it's so hard to wrangle. Um, and, you know, for the good or the bad, one of the things for, you know, one of the things for um, Encoded was we've really worked on not overreaching on our Kickstarter, like on our Kickstarters and our public and our publications by keeping it simple and it's not sexy, right? I've not made six figures on a Kickstarter because, you know, I don't have, you know, 700 things going on or 10, you know, like, you know, two dozen, um, you know, stretch goal writers or anything else. But, you know, I think a six week deviation from baseline is not a terrible uh, is not terrible, you know, to brag about or a very high uh, approval rating from yeah. backers, right? Like, I think we've done very, like, we've had very satisfied backers who've who've backed our Kickstarters before. Those are decisions you make as you're deciding to publish um, how complicated, how big you want to go. My personal philosophy has always been uh, to build up. Right. So I did not swing for the fences. I, um, I, I got a first base hit. Right. And yeah, then, you just and then, on base, man. right. And then, and then the second Kickstarter, well, we're, we're going to do a little bit more than the first Kickstarter. Right. Um, and build from there. That's just a personal preference of mine. I, I don't begrudge people who swing for the fences. Um, but I do, um, and again, this could be part of our Kickstarter talk. Hmm. Uh, the toll of having a, a Kickstarter project that is running over and with backers who are upset um, can be very mm. detrimental. Yeah. I, that's, yeah. that's a whole separate discussion and probably, and probably um, going to get asked from everybody yeah, to talk about. I know, but I don't know if it's really one that we should even. Well, I mean, we could, I mean, if people wanted to hear stuff about Kickstarters or whatever, we could potentially talk about that. I don't want to talk about that, like, the, like that part of Kickstarter, but, yeah. it, but it, but it, but we've all seen campaigns go sour. We have. And yep. it's, and you know, and you know, you may be angry on one side because you, you know, put up $50, but I guarantee you the creator feels even a hundred times worse. Yep. And they're getting so, it from a hundred other people. It's brutal. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's, let's end on a cheerful note and mm-hmm. let me end this by saying that 
um, and I say this, I've said this very frequently, every year it becomes easier to publish your own stuff. Yeah. Like the barrier to publishing things continues to drop year by year. When I was a kid, the idea of making a game was like a, like it was like a fantasy. Like you did like, I like couldn't even conceive how somebody made a game or even paid for it. We just now live in a time where honestly, if you have a good idea and either a little bit of money or willing to learn a few of a couple of skills, You can tap into a set of services that will produce a book that you can go put on your shelf. Yeah. And it feels really good, man. Yes, it does. Let me me, me tell you, let me tell you, there's nothing like, there's nothing like opening up a box of books and seeing like your game as a thing. Like, (laughs) um, it doesn't, doesn't suck and, uh, it doesn't get old. I don't think you get jaded by it. I think every one of them is like, it's like having kids. Like you love every one of them differently. So, all right. With that, um, yes. we should get out of here because it's should. been an hour. Yeah, we and, talked a um, lot. In order to get out of here, we got to talk about another show on the Misdirected Mark Network. You got to tell me what that show is and tell me a little something about it. Yeah, sure. Um, tonight we're going to talk about Zhang Hu Hustle, um, where you can train alongside fellow students Eric Farmer and Eli Kurtz. And uh, I know that they're sort of doing a little bit of like pandemic um off of the podcasting but they're still doing cool live show stuff so you should still go check them out um basically they make their kung fu stronger by watching wuxia films and then discussing how to apply their observations to game design which is just cool so they've been watching a bunch of wuxia films so you can go watch wuxia films with them and talk about it plus saying wuxia never gets old right let's just be clear saying wuxia never gets old um Okay, cool. Uh, say, Senda, where can people find us on the internet? Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games. You can find us uh, in the Misdirected Mark forums, which is forums.misdirectedmark.com. You can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com, or you can be super fancy and find our individual accounts on the, the Tiki Talkies and <laughs> drop us a video there with the... Uh, you know, stuff, because we'll use your audio. I totally just started to steal Phil's bit, which is how you know that we do this bespoke every single time. Phil, once they find us in one of those places, what can they do with that information? Leave us a question, a topic, an idea, whatever it is you want to hear us talk about. Our goal here is always to help uh, you make your games better and more enjoyable. Uh, So if you have a question or you're curious about something with regards to gaming, uh, the chances are somebody else who's listening to this podcast has also would also benefit from hearing that advice. So we would like to uh, share that with you. So just do that. Um, you know, like, look, in the beginning, we were so specific about things that we needed. But like nowadays, man, just toss something out there. Whatever. We're great. Just throw us a topic you want to hear us chat about or like. We're so we're so good on so it. We got it. Co- we got it covered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you should do that. Uh, if you like what we do here elsewhere on the Mr. Mark Network, please consider backing our Patreon campaign. Go to patreon.com slash MMP. Uh, patrons get the Bamboo Lounge, which is the uh, nonsense that happens at the end of this episode. <laughs> mm-hmm. The After Show, which is the nonsense that happens at the end of the Mr. Mark podcast. Uh-huh. You get access to the Slack Room for Life. And I'm going to tell you that's my favorite part. Like... I I think the Bamboo Lounge is pretty funny. The After Show is 50-50, depending on what mood I'm in. Um, but... The Slack community. Just fantastic. I love the people who are there. Um, I love the interactions with everybody. We have our Friday luncheons. If you're working from home and you want to jump on Zoom with us, like if you're a patron, you can come jump in and do all that stuff. If you want to like see, you know, PK's amazing oh cooking. Oh my gosh. And, and PK's not the only one, but PK's no, like, but he's, PK's actually working towards a goal at this point. Right. Um, Oof, but there are some other people. Really, Jane, really good. Jane's got some great food. They like, they make some really good stuff. I throw the occasional thing in there. You throw the occasional, like, like, you know, it's become much more occasional for me. Cause I'm on a rut. I'm oh like, yeah. Hey. I mean, Andrew, Andrew Dacey's in there putting food and like, there's some good food. Um, we have, you know, we talk about role playing games. Obviously, we talk about media. Um, we, t- you know, like we have a great, I, I like we've had a really great community centered around the pandemic. Like we have a COVID nineteen channel um, that started with us just sharing what information we knew, um, and now is just basically becoming a posting of who's getting their yeah, vaccines. Yeah, like yay, like, I'm getting vaccinated, and we all go yeah. yay. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like it, it, like it's really it's really great. Um, but anyway, um, you should just come join us um, if you can. Um, if you um, if you're able to support the Patreon campaign, uh, we greatly appreciate it. It makes it makes the wheels go round around here. So thank you very much. If you're unable to uh, support the Patreon campaign, we totally understand. Um, but there's like one more thing we hmm. could use some help with. Um, it's true. You could leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, we appreciate them everywhere. It generally helps the algorithm float us up to the top, and it definitely encourages new people to listen to the show. But you can also just tell your friends on Twitter, which has been happening a lot recently, and I will tell you, it gives me warm, fuzzy feelings inside my tummy when people are like, you should just listen to Pandas Talking Games. And I'm like, wee, that's so nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, anyway, if you leave us a review someplace and it's not the U.S. iTunes Apple podcast store, um, you should tell me about it so I could go find it because <laughs> I want to read it and yeah, I'll be super happy about it. And it's impossible to track all those places. So thank you so very much to everybody who's already left a review. We really, really do appreciate it so very much. We do indeed. Thank you. Okie dokie. Uh, say send a um, we're probably going to need to find a topic uh, for next week. So show mm-hmm. me what topics we might talk about next week. <laughs> this show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Show me what you got. 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 So I got to tell you the other day, I forget where I was recording. I think it was just getting ready for Mr. Mark. And um, Jerry didn't say clicky and like threw the whole thing off. Like we all clicked, but he was like three, two, one. And like he starts, like he's like record and we're all like, you're supposed to say clicky. Say and he's clicky. like, he's like, that's Obviously. he's like, that send us thing. I'm like, whatever. I'm like, we all know how to use it. No, like, <laughs> that's, that's, that is, it's, it is the queen's way. <laughs> yes. So it was a whole thing about failure to, uh, failure to clicky properly. I mean, I have to admit, and I know I've done it to you before and messed us up before, I consistently have to resist the urge to say, three, two, one, let's jam, because no one will click on let's jam, and then it's all messed up. I would actually, though. I really just want to every time. Yeah. We should do a Cowboy Bebop watch through. Yeah, I mean, we've all seen it, though, but yeah, we could go through it. That's true. Well, then, screw that. We should do a Samurai Champloo watch through. (laughs) It's possible. Are you going to go curate some episodes for me? Yeah, I'd have to go rewatch it. (laughs) All right. Um, It's been a long time. Good. We're going to start recording now. I mean, we started. We're going to start. Start the show. We're going to start the show now. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Bloop. Do, do, Show me what you got. No. Do, 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 do. Let's jam. I don't know. I've lost all the sounds in my head. I'll take over from this point. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs>